Well, good evening, folks. Welcome to our evening gospel service. Do thank you for coming out. We're going to sing a few choruses and give praise and glory to our blessed Saviour. The first one is Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be glory, honour and praise. tonight and give glory and praise to him. All heaven declares the glory of a risen Lord is the next one. of love is this, that God gave himself for, a, for me. I am the guilty one, yet I go free. You know, I often marvel and wonder how God could ever love a wretch like me. But I'm so thankful tonight, and through God's grace, I can stand here, saved by grace. What kind of love is this, that God should love us?
we continue on in his presence tonight. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. Do you know him tonight? We urge you tonight, if you don't know him, come to know our blessed Savior. <laughs> Yes. 
Amen. Thank you for singing so well. Thank you for coming out to join with us tonight here in Van Bridge. We appreciate that very much. Let's just take a moment quietly and let's come to God in prayer and ask for his blessing upon each of us this evening. Our God and our Father, as we still our hearts in your presence just now, we marvel at the great love that you have for sinners like us. We thank you for the love that sent your own lovely Son down from the heights of glory to this world of sin, that he might die on an old rugged cross and there deal with our sin in its entirety. We thank you that the Apostle Paul could say of him, the Son of God loved me, and he gave himself for me. And we thank you, our Father, tonight that there are many of us who are sitting in this meeting just now who could say exactly the same thing. The Son of God loved me, and he gave himself for me. Father, we thank you that though you are a God who is thrice holy, one who dwells in eternity, that you looked upon us with all our great need. We thank you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Father, we thank you that in love you sent your Son and in love the Lord Jesus Christ came and laid down his life at the place called Calvary. And how marvelous that is. What a wonderful story that the Lord Jesus Christ should take our sin and our sorrow and make them his very own. Tonight, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for everything that was accomplished at Calvary on behalf of a world of sinners lost and ruined by the fall. Father, as we approach you tonight, we recognize that you are a thrice holy God and that we only have access to you through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We come to thank you for another Lord's Day. We thank you for the blessing of this morning and the time that we were able to spend together. And here we are again tonight gathered in your presence longing for the touch of God upon us, longing that we might hear the voice of God through his word, and longing that the Spirit of God might touch hearts and homes tonight, and our Father, that he might bring salvation. Father, we rejoice that right across our province and further afield there are those who are out sharing the gospel we thank you, Father, that many will have the opportunity to hear it. And we pray that God will bless every effort and that there might be signs following the preaching of your word. We pray, our Father, that many will close in with your offer of mercy and seek the Lord Jesus Christ while he is to be found and to call upon him while he is near. Bless every servant tonight, those who will minister your word, those who go out to sing, those, our Father, who will testify in various places. May the hand of God be upon each one of them, and may the blessing of God be their portion tonight. Remember those, our Father, who would love to meet with us, but they can't be here for various reasons. Some are in hospital, and we commend them to you. Some are recovering at home, having been in hospital. Some are elderly now and are no longer able to come out from their homes to meet with us. And several are in residential care. For them, we pray to our Father that you would minister into their lives tonight and assure them that they're not forgotten about, that God loves them and that God's people are praying for them. So we come to you, our Father. We thank you for this, the evening of your own day. 
and we ask for God's blessing to be upon each one of us. And as always, we ask it in and through the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now let me bid you all a very warm welcome as you join us tonight here in Banbridge Baptist Church. And for those who are joining us on Facebook Live, we thank you too for joining us and we trust that God will bless each one of us. If you're visiting with us, we thank you for coming, and we trust you'll be able to come back and meet with us on a further occasion, but we pray tonight that you might be blessed as you fellowship with us here. Now, our singer tonight, Judith Beatty, unfortunately was not able to come as announced this morning, and we are sorry about that. Some announcements for the incoming week, Wednesday, 8 o'clock through to 9, will be our prayer meeting. And then next Lord's Day, the 25th, 10.45, our prayer meeting, 11.30, morning service and the breaking of bread. Children's creche will be Diane Maidley, Megan Nelson, and Kristen Guinness. 5.45, next Sunday night, God willing, we meet again for a season of prayer at 5.45, that precedes our gospel meeting at half past six. God willing, I will be preaching at both services. Would all departmental leaders please uh, forward their starting dates for the new term to the church secretary as soon as possible. I know some are trying to do that, and we do appreciate that. Regarding our toddlers group, we could do with at least four more uh, new people to put down their name on the rota before we can give a starting date. If you feel that you could help out in this way in some measure or if you're unsure about what is actually involved, please do contact Selina Fairburn or Julie Corbett and they will explain what is involved to you. The list for children's talks is now available on the table in the foyer. If you're on that list, please take one with you tonight. Our missionary conference will run from Sunday the 1st to Thursday the 5th of September. Now, these flyers are available outside on the table in the foyer. Please take one or two with you. They're not just for you, but you might want to encourage someone you know that has a heart for mission to come and to share with us on that occasion. All the details of all the speakers are all inside, and we trust that you'll make an effort, put it in your diary, and plan to be along during those nights. Each night at 8 o'clock, and there will be an opportunity to speak with the missionaries following that, and to have a time of fellowship with each other over a cup of tea. A baptismal service will be held on Sunday night, the 8th of September, uh, maybe you're thinking about that and haven't said to me yet. Well, if you're interested in being baptized on that occasion, please contact me as soon as possible. These are all the announcements. They're made subject, as always, to the Lord's will. Now, let's sing another hymn together. We'll stand and sing this, and then we're going to read God's word. Think about it, and let's sing this hymn first of all. Fairest of all, the earth beside, chiefest of all, unto thy bride, fullness divine in thee I see, wonderful man of Calvary. Let's stand and sing after the introduction.
Amen. Now turn with me, please, in your Bible to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. We're going to begin our reading at a very familiar story in verse 13. So let's turn to Luke chapter 24 and reading at verse 13. Let's listen to the word of God. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even as so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he set at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the Scriptures? They rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. For a few Sunday nights together in the lessons from Dr. Luke, we've been looking at some great events that have taken place regarding the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been to the place called Calvary, and what a place that is, Golgotha, Here's the place where the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died in our guilty room instead. Luke simply 
puts it like this, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Those words there, they crucified him, do not do justice to the shortness of that little phrase, because we know with regards to crucifixion that crucifixion was the most horrible death that any man would ever have to endure. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ endured it at the place called Calvary. When he went to that center cross and when he died for your sins and when he died for mine. Without that death and without the debt that he paid, you and I could never, ever have been saved. Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. But you know, two men were also crucified that day with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we looked at those two men, two thieves, guilty of their crimes, hanging one on either side of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these men were in a desperate plight. They were in a helpless, hopeless state. They're staring death in the face, and very soon they're going to go out into eternity, but they're going to go out into eternity without hope. And then one of the men, the thieves, had a change of heart. And as he looked at the man on the center cross, he said to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This man not only had a change of heart, he experienced a change of life. He acknowledged his sin. He knew he was guilty and under divine judgment. And Jesus heard his cry, and he said to the man, today you shall be with me in paradise. And paradise, of course, is just a synonym for heaven. And Jesus assured that man that very day he would be with him. But then we came from Calvary to the dawning of a new day, and we looked at the tomb where the Lord Jesus Christ had been buried. It wasn't his tomb, and he wasn't in it very long. It was a tomb that belonged to a man called Joseph of Arimathea. The Lord Jesus Christ, who had come to do their father's will, fulfilled that will in total obedience in every aspect of it. He suffered, he bled, he died, and he was taken from the cross and he was buried in this tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. And when the ladies came on that first morning to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the tomb was empty. And Jesus wasn't there. Because Jesus had done what he said he would do. He taught his disciples. They didn't understand it. But Jesus said that he must suffer and on the third day rise again from the dead. And he did that. The tomb was empty and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was gone. And what a question was asked at the tomb when the two angels said, Why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Not wonderful truth. It's not something tonight worth rejoicing in as Christians. That not only is he no longer on the cross, he's no longer in the tomb. For up from the grave he arose and he has ascended now back to heaven where he's able to save to the uttermost all who will come unto God by him. The tomb tonight is empty. For Jesus Christ has defeated sin, Satan, death, and the grave. But tonight we come to the verses I've read to you here, and I'm trying to get the connection between everything that happened when the Lord Jesus made his way up Golgotha's hillside and all the events that took place. And now we come to another great event here in Luke chapter 24. You see, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was not a tragedy. It was a triumph. We've noted his arrest and betrayal. We've noted the denial of Peter, the interrogation of Pilate, his death on the cross and the resurrection from the tomb. Tonight we're going to look at the two on the Emmaus Road. 
Do you know of all the resurrection stories, and there are many of them, this is my favorite of them all. Because every time I read it, I think about those two travelers, weary with all that had happened in Jerusalem, not knowing what would now befall them since the Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom they had put their hope, had now gone. And then the Lord Jesus, as we have read, comes to them. And they had a wonderful experience. And I'm sure that throughout their lifetime, time and time again, they would have told the story of what happened on the Emmaus Road. What did happen? Well, come with me to these verses tonight. Let me be very brief and deal with three different things. Firstly, we see that these two people were shocked. Look at the opening verses of Luke 24. Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now Luke begins a new section in his account, and he says the words, and behold. Now for those of you who like to know these things, I just want to say to you tonight, if you look back through Luke's gospel account, it's interesting that 26 times he uses the words, and behold, and behold. And here he begins a new section. It didn't end at the cross. It didn't end at the tomb. There is still a story to tell. And Luke's going to tell that story again in the lives of these two. Two people who were shocked. Obviously, they were making their way home. They weren't apostles. But they already knew that heard not only about the death of Christ, something they probably had witnessed, but they had heard the resurrection story for themselves, but they didn't believe it. They were sad and they were gloomy and they were making their way home as if there was no hope anymore for them and for others. According to Luke 24, 10 and 11, they weren't the only ones who didn't believe what had taken place at the cross and at the tomb. For it says this, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles, and their words seemed to be them as idle tales. Then Luke adds this phrase, and they believed them not. And they believed them not. I wonder, is that why some of you who are sitting in the meeting tonight, and maybe some of you who are sitting at home tonight are not saved. Because no matter how often you hear the gospel, no matter how it's presented to you, no matter who the preacher might be, you just won't believe the Word of God. You're not saying it's not true. You're just saying you will not believe it. It's not that you don't know the content of the gospel message. Some of you know it off by heart. Some of you have grown up in a Christian home. Some of you could walk from the pew tonight up these stairs over to this pulpit and you could preach the very gospel that I proclaim this evening. It's not that you don't know the content. It's just you won't believe in Christ. It's not that you don't know about the death of Jesus. I've met people, I know people, who go out to church on a Sunday, and you know why they go out? They love to sing hymns about the cross. They love to sing good, moving hymns about Jesus. They love to be there to sense the atmosphere. They know the gospel. They know why Jesus died. They know everything that needs to be known about Calvary, but they will not believe. It's not that you don't know that you're a sinner living under the condemnation of God. It's just that you won't accept that willingly. 
And it's not that you don't know the gospel message. You just won't believe. Now, you have someone tonight who sympathizes with you, and that's me. I heard the gospel as a child. I grew up sitting in meetings with my brother and other people that I worked with. I knew the gospel. I heard the gospel, but I didn't believe it. Not until that night when God spoke to my heart and I trusted Christ. You see, there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to have to do something with Jesus. There's going to have to come a time in your life where either you believe the gospel and you trust Christ as your Savior or you reject the gospel and like others of his day, you say, I will not have this man to rule over me and then you'll die in your sin and you'll slip out into eternity and you'll be lost forever. Imagine that. Knowing the gospel. Love good gospel singing. Love to sit amongst God's people. Know it off by heart and still die in your sin and be lost. What a tragedy. Here's two, two people on their way home up the Emmaus Road. And we know from our story it was late in the day when this experience took place that they were going home a distance of seven miles. Normally it would take someone walking slowly about two hours. And what they were doing was talking about all the events that had taken place in Jerusalem. I believe they had witnessed the crucifixion of Christ. But for them the whole affair seemed to be a great tragedy. It may well be that they had heard the stories that were circulating about the fact that Christ's body was missing. They were shocked. They were disturbed. They were probably wondering, how could it all have worked out like this? Now, we don't know how long they had been with Jesus. We don't know what they had heard, but they had been convinced that Jesus was, in fact, their Messiah. Like others in the nation who believed the message of the prophets. They were waiting for their Messiah. If you want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to start in Matthew's gospel because the whole of the Old Testament, the law, Moses and the prophets, they all reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. They prepare the way for this man who will one day come from heaven to earth to save the people unto himself. These people knew that. They were familiar with the prophecies. They were waiting on their Messiah. But they hadn't grasped what Jesus said during his earthly ministry. Any thought of resurrection was far from their mind. And these two travelers are going along the road and they're shocked because their hope had been dashed. We see the two people were shocked. We see that these two people were sad. Here they are tramping home in a state of despair. Jesus had died. The hope of Israel would never have died on a cross. The Messiah wouldn't be taken at the hands of evil men and uplifted. There on a cross at Calvary, that wasn't our Messiah. The Messiah they expected was someone who would come and rid them of the oppression of the Romans. They didn't expect a Messiah to die on a cross for sin. But that's what he did. And that's why he came. And that's why his death matters. They put their hope in him and all their hopes were dies for we know they were sad. Jesus draws near, it says, verse 17. And he said to them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Jesus came alongside them. He saw their drooping heads. He knew their hurting hearts. He knew exactly how they felt. Now, they didn't know who Jesus was at this stage. 
It was quite common in those times that people were out walking and in their culture, a stranger would come and walk alongside for safety, for conversation. And this man just came alongside the two of the Emmaus Road. They didn't recognize him because they weren't expecting him. But he knew all about them. Why are you sad? Thought about that. Maybe you're here tonight, child of God, and that sums up your life at the moment. Sad, distressed, everything against you. No one understands you. Never been this way before, not coping because it just seems as if life is horrible. Well, I want to tell you tonight, there's a man in the glory a great high priest whose name is Jesus Christ, and he's touched with all the feeling of your infirmities. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. He's a leading shepherd. He's a loving shepherd. He didn't go all the way to the cross to shed his blood to save you, to abandon you at this present time. That's not who he is. Maybe you're sitting here tonight, you're saying, Pastor, I'd love to believe that, but life is so tough for me at the moment. You're sad. Look to Jesus. Peter tells us to cast all our care upon him, for he cares for us. You don't have to carry the burden alone. The Lord Jesus Christ will come alongside you And he'll not only help you bear your burden, he'll help you to cope. But here's these two in the way, and they're sad, and they're shocked, and they're discouraged. They didn't understand who Jesus was. They couldn't understand why their Messiah had let them down. They couldn't understand why this man that they had put their trust in was no longer alive and offered them no longer any hope. Well, listen to this. These two people were shocked. These two people were sad. These two people were surprised. Remember that Luke tells us that they didn't recognize who Jesus was, but then it says this. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are to come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What thing? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a mighty prophet indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Now listen to this phrase. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Do you know what these two were saying? They'd been up to Jerusalem. They had seen the Lord Jesus Christ taken at the hands of evil men. They had watched what they thought was the hope of Israel being crucified on a cross between these two thieves. They were saddened that he was dying. But they were more sad because he wasn't the man they thought he was. They said they had put their hopes in this man, trusted in this man, hoping that he might be their Messiah, the hope of Israel, and yet he had died. Isn't it a good job he died? It's not why he came. He came to lay down his life on the cross that those of us who had no hope might be saved. 
but they couldn't see it. They even told them that certain women had gone to the tomb to anoint the body, but the body was missing. And that must have rung in the heart of Jesus, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Do you know what he said to them? O oh, fools, so of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning themselves, himself. You see, here's the thing about these two. They were well versed in the scriptures. And they were actually looking for a Messiah. And they came that day to Jerusalem believing in their heart, trusting that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, that he would be the Messiah. And then they said he can't be. He's dying on a cross. But that's the very reason why he came. And Jesus said to them, look, why are you slow of heart to believe these things? Christ must suffer these things and then enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I'd love to have been there. I really would love to have been there. When Jesus sat with them in their own home and opened up the Old Testament scriptures to them and answered their questions as they come to this man and they spoke about Moses and they talked about the lawgiver and they spoke about the prophets and they spoke about their hope and they spoke about this Great thing. But you know, like so many people of his day, regarding Christ, they had a limited view of Scripture. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know the Scriptures, so they didn't know the Savior. And didn't the Lord Jesus Christ say that to the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of their day, you err. Why? Because you know not the Scriptures. See, some people will say to me, oh, well, I don't bother much with church because I, I'm just quite happy. I learn at home. I know what I do and I know what I won't do. Hold on a moment. There's a reason why people like me preach the Scriptures. And Jesus sat with these two men, answered their questions. They had invited him into their home, and what a surprise it was that when their eyes were opened, they saw him. They saw him. Can you imagine that? Sitting at the table, sad, shocked, without hope, they saw Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, everything changed. And these two looked at themselves and they realized this was the risen Lord. This was their Messiah. They recognized him. And now that he had explained the scriptures, they knew the Savior. Maybe tonight that's why you're not a Christian. It's not that you don't want to be saved. It's just you don't understand these things. You'd be ashamed to come and say, Pastor, you see that, that you were talking about salvation. Could you explain that to me? I'd take all night to explain that to you if that's necessary. Because unless we understand the Scriptures and what they teach about Jesus, we'll never come to know him. Maybe you've been brought up in a Christian home, not saved. 
because you don't obey the Scriptures. Maybe you've sat in church every week opening your Bible, putting it on your knee, and you still don't know the Scriptures. Well, then you need to sit down with somebody and talk it through. Begin to understand the Word of God. Because after all, it's the entrance of God's word that brings light. I'm not condemning you for where you might be. But I want to say to you this book that our world today doesn't want to see, hear, or keep. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And child of God, I say to you tonight, if this book is all about Jesus, read it, protect it, and tell it. Stand up for it. At school, university, wherever your workplace might be, the scriptures refer to the word of God, and from beginning to end, they talk about Jesus. Revealing us coming into the world. The one promised in Old Testament scriptures, his virgin birth and why it was necessary, his life on earth and his ministry amongst the people, the need and nature of his death at Calvary, the reason why he left the glory of heaven, why the resurrection had to take place, why both the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ lie at the very heart of the Christian gospel, the ascension, his coming again, the destruction of this old world. It's all there. It's all there. And whenever you begin to know the Scriptures, you'll begin to know the Savior. And it was only when Jesus drew near and revealed himself to these truths that they began to understand. You say to me, that's great, but what's the purpose of the story? What's the point in all of this? We know these two men were shocked and they were sad and They were surprised. But what's the point? Well, the point is this. They had proof. If ever proof was ever needed that Jesus Christ was alive and Jesus Christ was whom he said he was. His body was not missing. He's very much alive. They had seen him. They would now return to Jerusalem and they would share this great news with others. And if you and I, like the two in the Emmaus Road, have seen him and know him and our hearts are warmed by his fellowship every day, tell others. Tell others. Tell them the good news about Jesus. I know we live in a difficult world. Times are harsh. People are discouraged. But you know, so many people are living without hope. These two on the Emmaus Road were without hope. And when Jesus revealed himself to them, everything changed. You see, that's the thing about Jesus. Not only can he and he alone meet us at the point of our deep spiritual need, but he can answer our unanswered questions. He can fill the longing, the deepest longing in the soul. He can heal the hurt and the broken hearted. He can bring peace to the soul where there's great pain. In fact, there is not a need tonight that Jesus cannot meet. Not a need. If only we would trust him. And if only we would walk with him. And if only we would see him for who he is and all that he is able to do. I want to say this to you tonight, that Jesus is not an easy fix. 
or nor is he an answer just to the problems of life that we face. He wants to be our Savior. He wants us to trust him, to put everything concerning us into his hands. He wants us to enjoy fellowship with him on a daily basis as we read his word. Jesus wants us to submit to him daily and walk with him every moment of the day. You might not believe it tonight, but I want to tell you, that Jesus Christ can make the difference in your life. He can. There are many people here who could rise up in a moment of time and say, that's true, let me tell you what he did for me. But I'd rather listen to the two in the Emmaus Road or when Jesus came to them. The hope that was gone was now restored and he transformed them he gave them a life worth living and what he did in the two to the Emmaus road in their lives he can do in your life and he can do in mine just two ordinary people like you and me coming from Jerusalem on their way home they're sad and they're shocked and they've lost hope. And Jesus sat with them, opened their eyes and gave them something worth living for. Is that what you're looking for in life? Well, I'll tell you, no one else can do it but Jesus. It happened for the two in the Emmaus Road. It can happen for you tonight too. Let's pray together just for a moment. Father, we recognize these lovely stories contained in your word are not just stories in themselves. They're there to point us to the Lord Jesus, to bring us hope in the midst of the dark world in which we live. They're there to remind us that he is not just a great saviour, but a shepherd and one who's with us every moment of every day. Father, we pray that as we think about him, that none of us will go home without hope. Father, that we might bow the knee in repentance and faith, trust him as our saviour, and knowing that through him one day we shall share in his eternal glory. Help us, we pray, to take that step of faith, not just to know about him, but to know him personally as our Savior. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this lovely hymn as we close. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name.
Father, we thank you tonight that we don't need to live without hope. In Christ alone, our hope is found. And tonight, we thank you that he ever left the heights of glory to come into this world of sin. Your word tells us that he came to bleed and to die and to suffer in our stead. Thank you that he died, that he rose again. Thank you tonight that he is a living and a loving Savior. We pray that those who know him not will not press on in life without hope, but they might find their hope in him. Thank you for our time together today. We ask your blessing upon us as we part just now. Take us to our homes in safety. Watch over us throughout this incoming week. And might we be ever conscious of the presence of our living Christ. All these things we ask for his glory and in his precious name. Amen. Amen.